Hi, everyone. Welcome to PRSA Detroit Presents Keys to Content Strategy and Calendar Development. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Jeff Adkins. I'm co-founder of the Programming Committee for PRSA Detroit. Today's program will be a live discussion on best practices to keep in mind when developing your content strategy and the role of calendars to organize and outline your plan. Our expert panelists will share insights on the value and differences between editorial and content calendars and provide tips on what you should or should not be including for best results. Throughout the program, please drop your questions in the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. We'll walk through those at the end of the program. The last 10 to 15 minutes or so, we'll cover as many as possible, hopefully all of them. Um, as usual, following the program ending at 1 p.m., we will keep the Zoom open for a little while for casual networking. If you wanna stick around, um, I'll promote you over to panelists. You can chat with the uh, panelists for a little bit and myself. So please feel free to stick around if you can. Um, as usual, before we jump into this, we're gonna read the uh, PRSA antitrust statement. So we read this before all PRSA uh, meetings and events. PRSA's policy is to comply fully and strictly with all federal and state antitrust laws. Meetings and programs held under the auspices of PRSA must be conducted in a manner that avoids the fact or appearance of conduct that may violate the antitrust laws. Participants are not to discuss industry-wide or individual company prices, current or projected, or matters relating to pricing such as costs, profits, contractual terms and conditions like discounts or credit terms, wages or salaries, market allocation, market shares or sales, clients or customers, or other competitively sensitive information. Compliance with the antitrust laws is a requirement for PRSA membership and the responsibility for compliance rests with each member. Participants in the PRSA meetings and programs have an obligation to terminate any discussion, seek legal counsel's advice, or if necessary, terminate any meeting for the discussion um, if it might be construed to raise any antitrust risks. Um, with that, I'm going to um, go ahead and introduce our moderator today. It's my pleasure to do so. So Georgie Kirsten will be serving as our moderator. She is co-chair of PRSA's Programming Committee and Global Marketing Communications Manager at Chemtrend. Uh, Georgie is a 15 plus year Marcoms professional. Uh, she holds an expansive portfolio of work experience in traditional and experiential advertising, content marketing and PR for a variety of brands, including Ford, Cadillac, Panasonic and White Castle. Currently, she is a global marketing communications manager for, at Chemtrend, a global process chemical specialties manufacturer, where she leads the development of external and internal communications to support the strengthening of the Chemtrend brand furthering its awareness across the myriad of industries that it serves. Georgie holds a bachelor's in advertising and promotion from Western Michigan University and a master's in public relations from uh, Michigan State University. After her earning her APR in 2018, Georgie took a more active role in the PRC Detroit chapter and now serves as co-chair of the programming committee, working to bring meaningful programs to uh, Pro PRC Detroit's membership. Georgie, thank you so much for serving as moderator today and I'll hand it over to you. Great, thanks Jeff, I appreciate it. It's my pleasure to now introduce our three panelists. I'm gonna start with Courtney Mathis. Math, uh, Courtney is a publicist with a decade of public relations experience. Her clients have been seen on Good Morning America, Newsweek, Essence, Vogue, Travel Noir, Billboard, Bravo, CBS, Sirius, and myriad others. She holds a specialty in entertainment, public relations, culinary industry, fashion, political, nonprofit organizations, and corporations, such as Detroit City Councilman Roy McAllister Jr., NAACP Detroit Chapter, and Foundation of Detroit Jazz Festival. Experienced in creative direction and production, Mathis is, has developed viral content and stories for influencers, artists, and Grammy-nominated producers, and is proficient in social media strategy, live and virtual experiences, including event coordination, management, and consulting. Welcome to the panel, Courtney. Thank you for having me. And look, go Broncos. I also went to Western Michigan University. Right on, go Broncos. <laughs> Next is Olivia Pearson, Communications Director of Beepers Detroit and Senior Publicist, Founder of The Social Publicist. Olivia is a strategic communicator based in Detroit, Michigan. As a senior publicist and founder of her own boutique agency, The Social Publicist, Pearson is dedicated to helping unheard voices communicate their value. While she has served a plethora of small brands and businesses in the past, Pearson has narrowed her agency's focus to professional athletes and consumer brands. Through a careful mix of media relations, brand partnerships, visual branding, and social strategy, Pearson has worked on projects to support Olympic sprinter Shelly Ann Frazier Price, Apple, and even the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Prior to her launching her agency, 
Pearson has worked in numerous communications roles at companies like DTE Energy to support major enterprises and public affairs like Beacon Park and Detroit Southwest Corridor, Detroit Public Schools Community District to help engage parents and guardians under the district's new education reform, and Ford Motor Company across five North American manufacturing plants to integrate internal communications apps and corporate publications. Pearson earned a Bachelor of Arts in Public Relations from Wayne State University and serves as the executive board on the executive board of the National Black Public Relations Society Detroit chapter as communications director, helping to rebrand the organization through social media, copywriting, and web content. Thanks for being here, Olivia. Thank you so much for having me. And last but not least, we have Lexi Trimp, uh, Integrated Communications Supervisor and Digital Team Lead at Franco Detroit. Lexi develops and manages data-driven digital programming that moves the needle for her clients in tangible ways. Lexi works with a wide variety of Franco's B2B, automotive, and e-commerce clients with vast experience spanning from social media strategy and email marketing to content creation for engineering and automotive retail audiences. Before joining Franco in 2018, Lexi worked as web editor for Our Detroit, with bylines appearing in D Business, Model D Media, Eater Detroit, Thrillist, Roads and Kingdoms, and more. A writer at heart, Lexi is always searching for the best way to tell a story, even in 280 characters or less. A, as a self-professed professional nerd, Lexi playfully attributes her lifelong love of the internet to her parents buying her a gateway computer in elementary school. With an early knack for HTML and a lifelong passion for hearing and telling stories, her digital marketing career is more than two decades in the making. Lexi holds a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism from Wayne State University. Welcome, Lexi. Thank you. Very excited. Well, as you can see, we have quite a group of experts here. And what I'd like to do is serve up a first question um, that we'll work through for the next uh, 40 minutes or so, and then we'll do the Q&A. Um, so please, if you have questions, enter those um, in the box below, and we will get to those at the end of the program. So first, I'm going to serve this one up to you, Lexi, um, as we talk about um, crafting content strategy. What are some key things to keep in mind when you're crafting it for your client or brand? So I'm going to try to limit my answer on this because I feel like I could probably talk the entire 30 minutes on this topic <laughs> alone. Um, but in my very stereotypical nerdy way, I typically like to break this down into kind of two main focus areas. Uh, first, starting with the CTA. Um, and this isn't necessarily the CTA in which we've all kind of come to know it. But before doing any sort of content planning, um, it's really critical to determine the actions you actually want your audience to take. Um, determining that why first is really key, whether it's buying, donating, subscribing, whatever it might be, defining that action first is going to be critical. Um, that's also going to be critical to assessing what's going to be the best way to get them to take that action. Asking questions like, is a blog going to be most effective as, say, a video for getting some sort of emotional appeal? Or could a white paper maybe give these details a little bit better? So really defining that first is going to be key. And then also assessing the fact that there's likely multiple points in your customer journey. Um, so one message might need to be presented in multitudes of different ways to really be effective, kind of depending on where they're at in their customer journey. And then finally, the second half of that is capacity. Um, as we all know, quality is much more important than quantity in the content marketing game. So one really well done evergreen blog, ebook, article, white paper, whatever, is going to be so much more effective than three to five hastily put together content pieces. So taking a step back and really assessing what can we realistically do really well on a consistent basis is going to be critical. And that's going to keep you from doing things like launching a blog strategy if you don't have anyone to write it. Uh, really getting that is also key to optimizing your efforts. As we said before, you're going to have multiple points in your audience journey. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. So once you kind of determine what is your capacity, what are those touch points, start to repurpose some of that key content. That way you can really distribute those messages and reuse them in an effective way. Great, Lexi. And that process itself, do you undergo that directly with your client and brand? Yeah. So typically, um, because we are an integrated communications agency, we're typically touching a couple of other components within the larger communication strategy. But I think aligning both with marketing and with either sales or operations, whoever that other critical component um, and stakeholder is in that relationship, 
organizing and collaborating on what you're trying to get your audience to do is going to be really key to creating the sort of content that you know those key stakeholders actually see value in. Great point. Um, Courtney or Olivia, any comment there? Um, no, Lexi touched it all. The biggest, the biggest thing I would have wanted to comment on would be capacity. So many times people come up with these ideas that they can't sustain, and she just hit the nail on the head with that. Plotting it out on a quarterly basis, I find to be helpful too. Like just look ahead the next two months. We don't have to look at the entire year, but what can we do in 30 or 60 days? And I agree. I think um, knowing like realistic short-term goals could kind of help with like she said, like that end result. You know, hey, we could get you out of the press in the world, but are you prepared for that traffic um, when it's time, you know? So it's always better to like be prepared so we never like under deliver or over deliver. Great. All right, well, that was a perfect kickoff question here. And I think this will weave right into our next one when we're talking about developing trust with that target audience. So, you know, arguably one of the most valuable outcomes from any comms plan is developing that relationship. So you need to engage on meaningful topics, things that make sense to them and do so where they're happening. So how do you find these right topics and platforms, Courtney? Um, that target audience is crucial. Um, so doing the proper research to kind of gain like what's what publication is the best fit for that client. Um, who's that audience? You know, everyone wants to be featured on, of course, the mainstream outlets, but kind of diving deep into your product. Does this serve, you know, that clientele? Um, I say research is key in kind of getting to know your client. In the product because I wouldn't want to, you know, my reputation or the client's brand at Jeopardy if it's not a great quality product and we're saying we're kind of putting our relationships on the line with journalists and producers when we kind of give our stamp of approval. So research is key. Yeah, I see a lot of head nodding. Definitely having an understanding and an understanding of what fits, what works, what makes sense there. Uh, any other comment, Olivia or Lexi? Um, huh. I think the biggest thing with that is being able, because we do have clients who want certain things. They have, you know, dream results. But how are we actually communicating to them what's in alignment and what's not in alignment? Like this, of course, it would be great if you were in this publication, but honestly, this isn't going to serve you here. So I'm, I'm more interested as to what Courtney and Lexi um, have to say about that. Like, how are we, how do we even help our clients to understand that this is not the move for you? Mm -hmm. I think like what's one, what's for one client may not be for the other client, you know, it's kind of bring back, pulling back those layers to see, hey, like this may not be a great fit for you, but in the future, you know, it's baby steps. I think it comes with that alignment too that we had talked about in the beginning, both having your, you know, key contact with your clients, your marketing, but also your sales operation. What are kind of their expectations? What are they trying to achieve? And then aligning with that. Um, with all of our clients, we typically have some sort of breakdown or ratio of you know, how much effort should we really try to go towards these national publications versus, you know, more niche or trade publications where we know we had that influence. We might not have that same splash, but maybe we can weigh that a little bit more with a more, you know, effective campaign or more effective messaging with that audience. Um, so I think weighing a bit of those understandings really helps in the beginning when you kind of lay it out and start with what their key goals are as well. Sounds like establishing that upfront will lead to success at the end. Great point. So how, how do you implement this? There's some tools that you can, can use um, to make your process go a little smoother. Um, Olivia, can you talk a little bit about the difference in value of editorial calendars and content calendars? Do you use them both? H how do you use those? I use them both. Um, Lexi pointed out early on, a nice rule of thumb is to plan things by the quarter. 
I use the editorial calendar, break it up into quarters, and then I embed or include content calendars within that for each platform that the client's going to be using. Um, editorial calendars kind of set the framework for what your content should focus on. So as things get crazy or you have to pivot, you have something you can always go back to that you know, outlines your business goals and how we're actually going to accomplish them. While your content calendar is specifically um, calling out what you're, what kind of, how you're going to engage with your audience on these different platforms. So for organizations like Beepers, um, we found it most helpful to embed our multiple content calendars into our editorial calendar. This helps us piece together what we're creating for social, what we're including in our newsletter, and possibly what we're writing for our blog. Um, not, I like to say, so an uh, easy rule of thumb is to give each month a theme, but that may not always be in alignment with what you're trying to do. So just make sure that you're really thinking through how to customize your editorial calendar for your needs. Thanks for that. Any, any other thoughts on how you utilize calendars to help your team kind of manage that flow of content? I think to add to what Liv said, kind of breaking down the theme all the way down you know, it's so trendy now to where like, hey, it's National Pizza Day, or it's, you know, breaking it down even by the day, the month, National Women's Month. So, hey, you know, we could kind of cater your press around that theme. And, you know, it's always something trending in the news to where you kind of, sometimes you may have to kind of edit the calendar to fit what's going on in the news and, you know, the trends on social media. It sounds like flexibility is definitely a part of it. Um, Olivia, how, how important is it to have every interaction and placement marked within a calendar or, or how fluid or flexible do you think it really needs to be? Everything needs fluidity. Um, not every platform, whether it's social or otherwise, needs a content calendar um, just because it, it, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Um, I think my easiest example would be Twitter. While you can't plan out what you're gonna say, it's a it's a platform made for conversation. Or TikTok, it's, it's trend-based. So you really have to be on it to understand what's gonna be effective because if you're using something that's outdated, those views aren't gonna be there. That engagement isn't gonna be there. So um, there's a million things that you have to remember, but make sure that when you're choosing what to create a content calendar for or what to actually take on that you have the interest <laughs> and the wherewithal to be active on them. I see a lot of head nodding from you, Lexi. Did you have a comment related to that? Yeah, so just, I, I guess too, on some of the intricacies, um, I'm always really excited to hear that you never have one content calendar, right? Because um, for our purposes, I don't think for any of my clients or even for us as Franco, we have one content calendar. Um, we always obviously start with that million mile view, right? From the top down, showing how our content marketing owned media is also influencing our paid, shared, earned media, you know, kind of at that top level view. But then we also, you know, break into each one of those platforms. Um, when developing these calendars, one of my favorite things to do is just kind of stop before even open Excel, you know, smart sheets, whatever, just starting with a list are what are those items that we need to easily reference in order to be able to produce this in an efficient and effective way. So my example I always go to is, you know, you got to create a monthly blog calendar if you're doing monthly blogs. So things like, you know, what are any SEO considerations, your topic, who's your byline to author, publishing date, some of those just kind of core elements that you need to reference when building it out versus things like, you know, white papers, eBooks, webinars, anything that has a little bit more of a designed element, you're going to need to account for things like your copy editing, any production turnarounds, revisions, uh, tracking elements in any of your URLs, Salesforce codes, 
really taking a good, you know, list of what are those things that we need to do to not be emailing or sending each other slacks a million times of what does this need in it? Um, and putting that in that living doc has really been successful for us. Great insight, Lexi. And any, oh, go ahead, Olivia. I do. Um, actually, I'm glad she actually called out the specifics because with anybody that I'm working with, whether they have a social media playbook or not, I like to make sure that everything's listed out. Like these are all the things you should be considering, even if these aren't things that you use on an everyday basis, because as your content transforms, as things develop, as like Lexi spoke about, we're repurposing this content in different ways at different touch points. These are all the things we need to be considering. So I like to throw that in there too. Make sure that if your client or organization does not already have some type of playbook to go by, like a SOP, if you will, make sure that that's something that's developed in the process. I love that. I frequently say that, especially in the digital marketing or content marketing, whatever PR, we have way too much to try to remember on a daily basis. So giving yourself those tools to just easily reference the things you need to know just makes it so much easier. Perfect. And I think we touched on a little bit um, on the structure of the calendar, and it really depends on the platform and adding those links and details to make it easier for the team to execute on it. I think those are great points. I, I'm really excited to, to ask this next question, and I do want to serve it up to Olivia here. We're talking about innovation. You know, things just explode, right, in the digital space. Oh, good. I think you're, you're ready to answer this one. Um, what are the most innovative content plans including? What do you see out there that's being tested and trialed now that have it, hasn't been in the, in the not too distant past? Well, consumer brands specifically have a really nice, like they have a, a upper hand when it comes to filters, um, augmented reality, like everything from interior design to creating new worlds. I mean, let's let's think about the metaverse that's coming here. Like the possibilities are endless. So anytime I see a brand, um, a makeup brand, an eyeglass brand, a hat, a hat um, brand have some type of filter to let you try things on. We're even seeing now people are testing hair colors with, with augmented reality. Anytime you give your consumer a way to experience your product without being face-to-face, -face, especially in this COVID era, I think that that's something that speaks volumes. And then there's also a piece that I think people aren't taking advantage of right now, and that would be um, the voice. So think Google and Siri. And while every company may not have the capability to organically use these this type of technology, you can create sounds for TikTok, sounds for reels that can kind of imitate these experiences that you have. Um, think about how many times th throughout the years we've seen something on social media that says, ask Siri this, and she has some witty response as to whatever it is that you're asking her. If you can kind of replicate that to be applied to your brand so that people can use it, man, just, just watch that go viral. I think that it's something people really need to consider. Really, really consider the things that your kids and your students are raving about because it's going to be a goal of mine for you eventually. How do you get that client that's a little hesitant to try something new to try it? You have to change their mindset, right? A lot of, so you have some clients who are open and ready to jump on the new ways. And then you have those more traditional clients who care about numbers. And they're like, no, I need something that works. Um, it's really helping them to understand that you don't always have to be so rigid with your business. Like you have the opportunity to have a little bit of fun. Um, that's what is going to keep you passionate and your co consumers passionate. The more you enjoy what you're doing, the more people are going to enjoy using what you have. So that's kind of the approach that I take when trying to sway people into trying new things. Like, let it be light. Everything that you've done up to this point has been an experiment. Let's continue the process. 
swinging in from the B2B automotive space over here, where obviously, you know, sometimes it can be a little harder to get into some newer things. I think starting small for some of those elements too, in really controlled, low risk, low reward situations is always a great way to get them onto it. So while maybe we can't be necessarily getting them onto, you know, fully committing to doing, you know, AR or even getting a TikTok account, maybe we can do some stories and we can show a little bit of company culture in a funner way. Um, that you know, if they disappear, a little bit of low risk, low reward. So I think finding those kind of key starting points so they can start to see a little bit of the value and not just you know necessarily us telling them is a really easy way of being able to then grow it into a larger campaign. Can I add really quick before you chime in, mm-hmm. Courtney? I don't know if you were going to. Um, even for automotive, like think about their products. There are whole immersive AR experiences that customers can tap into being inside of a new car that isn't released yet or experiencing a ride that isn't available yet. So I I feel like if you could just get their mind on the way that they can do less and touch people before the actual product is available or before they have to spend money to put something out, I feel like more than likely they'll be like, okay, okay, you are the expert. All right. I think to add to um, both of you ladies pretty much is that aspect of going viral. And once you show them those insights of like, you know, the end result, they're going to hop on board. Hiring those influencers to promote, that helps them sell products faster, easier, and on a larger platform. I love that you mentioned the influencers too, because that's been another way that we found with some of our clients, especially those that maybe don't necessarily have the capacity to create some of this, you know, innovative content or really engaging content on their own. Partnering with a relevant industry influencer to help produce that sort of branded content is another great way of kind of, again, inching your way along with it, but kind of trying it before you commit. Great point. Oh, you guys are, are stimulating a lot of questions in the in the Q&A box. I want to take a few of those now. I know we're just half past. <laughs> so, so let's get to one from Aaron Robinson. What's the best way to create content that blends originality, SEO, and audience engagement? Seems to be tough with so much content similarity these days. Lexi? I like this one. Um, So I think part of this too is realigning some of the way that we think about SEO value in 2022, um, because some of the old ways in which we would, you know, keyword stuff and things along those lines aren't, you know, necessarily relevant anymore. That customer or audience consumption and engagement with your content is ultimately going to benefit your SEO so, so well. So I think starting first with your customer again, what is the content that they're looking for already organically? Um, it likely isn't related necessarily to your brand right away, right? So finding ways of then connecting your brand to the things that your audience already wants is kind of that sweet spot in the Venn diagram of where your content marketing can live. Olivia, did you have any any um, addition to that? Yes. Um, just like... Piggy, I hate this phrase, but piggybacking off of Lexi. (laughs) Um, Guys, make that content about, actually take the focus off of you and make it about your customer. That's the try, true, fail safe, easiest way. Let's think about all the memes that we can relate to as uh, communications professionals that we probably repost them like all the time. Making your content about the people that you're serving is one of the simplest, most organic ways to create content that's going to be sticky and that's going to get you those metrics that you desire. Great. Thank you. I've got another question here. What's your favorite tool for developing a content strategy? Is there a tool that you use? I'll take it because I'm really excited. Um, It's probably really overused, but I really enjoy using Later um, from all of the capabilities it has to source other people's contents or partner brand content and making sure that it's done in an ethical way so nobody feels like you stole their content or that they're not being contributed from having the capability to 
add contributors to your calendar. Um, so you can add, if you're on an enterprise level, you can add um, different employees within a department to contribute and not have the same types of uh, permissions um, to just running it for a small business. There's honestly like, it's, it's dummy proof. And it's kind of like the Photoshop of planners, if that makes sense in relation to like Canva, you have more control. So I probably have a, a couple of tools under my tool belt for a couple of different purposes on this. Um, I feel like from a content marketing front, um, SEM rush, obviously, if you don't have it, even getting like a smaller level with some of the smaller amount of credits has some really, really valuable um, tools to help you answer some of those questions that we had talked about before. What is your audience searching for? Um, ultimately to another free tool, and I feel like we don't talk about it enough, is Google Data Studio. Plugging that in with your Google Analytics, both of which are free, is a really easy way of creating easy to reference dashboards that can tell you what content on your website is working, what search phrase people are coming in off of. Um, and again, a really easy and digestible way that you can reference when building out those plans. Um, and then when actually laying out plans, um, smart sheets have always been one that we've gone to. But again, going back to the free, because I know sometimes we're always looking for free, there are a trillion fantastic Google Sheets templates out there and I hoard all of them. Um, I think I have about like 70 different content calendars all in a saved folder and I will Frankenstein them together all the time. So finding your favorite elements from various content calendars and then favoriting those to come back to later. Again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. We're doing a lot of important stuff all day. Don't spend time remaking a calendar. That is so great. And I do want to segue to a question that we did have, Lexi, and this was for you about communicating the metrics in a meaningful way. It sounds like you have a ton of tools. How do you share that data so the insights can get translated to the, to the client so you can show the value that you're offering? So I always like to kind of play again with two main rules of thumb when doing our reporting out. Um, the first one always being show instead of tell, creating easy to understand visualizations um, that combine multiple metrics to really show what's really happening on your website, on your social, with your content, with your audience um, is always gonna be more valuable than me talking to you or me sending you a whole bunch of paragraphs. Um, so starting first with trying to figure out a way of being able to visualize those. And there's, I mean, a million different data visualization tools out there. Um, agency analytics is a really great user-friendly one um, for some smaller agencies. Data Studio is free. Soma or Domo is another great one. Um, but again, just kind of finding what makes sense for you in terms of that data visualization and what you need with your client needs. And then the second one is when you're writing your analysis um, is always asking me, so what? Why should we care? Um, if your analysis is purely this is what happened, that's a report, not an analysis. So we really need to be able to infer something from it. What have we learned? What are we going to try next? What are we you know, not going to do anymore? Kind of giving those next steps and why you should care really needs to go in that analysis for any of those metrics to really hold any value. Perfect. Did you want to add, Olivia? Because this is something that I'm still tweaking, I feel like maybe it's something that I'll never really master. But question for you, Lexi, how are you when you're, you know, relaying these insights when people are focused or clients are focused on certain metrics they think are important? How do you dis disarm like their worry? Um, Let's all talk about page views. Um, <laughs> why are page views low? Um, why are clicks low? So I think that's where it's really important to, have, again, as much as you can, never looking at a single metric, because a single metric is never going to define your success. Um, when looking at things like page views, you know, your top performing blog can have, you know, X number percentage higher than all of your other blogs. But if your bounce rate is 100% and you have a three second time on page, it's really not doing anything for you. So much in that same way, I think it's you know important to start to flip it in a little bit and look at your metrics in a really realistic way. 
um, by presenting your reports in a more kind of cohesive way, kind of showing your metrics working together, it becomes a little easier, I find, for clients to stop focusing on just one in particular. But again, if they are really hyper fixated on that one, find your other metrics that complement it to kind of show what is the true story that's happening around it. I love reporting. I'm such a reporting nerd. <laughs> I love it. These are, this is great insight. I've been taking notes myself here. We've got lots of questions here in the Q&A. Let me um, move on to Steve. Can you share any examples of when a client wanted to pursue a type of content, but it wasn't a good fit for their brand? How do you advise them around that? And I think, Courtney, you had talked a little bit about that early on. Mm -hmm. any, any other thoughts or, or words of advice for Steve? Um, I would pretty much always, it always come back to the target audience. Like, what's our goal here for, you know, this content It's always, okay, with this content, do we want them to purchase something? Are we trying to, you know, like bring awareness to a topic? Just kind of dive deep into, you know, what's the end result, you know? And as far as content, sometimes it's okay to repurpose, like right? maybe repurpose. You could kind of hold off, I would say, if it's something that the client is kind of pressing, you can kind of hold off on that and try to repurpose something for, you know, another platform or like mention something from the stories can, you know, go to the grid or, you know, doing, using that IGTV and those lives. It's a lot of wiggle room there to where, you know, you can kind of get a bang for your buck. I think that you offering the sort of like alternatives to um is always really kind of going a long way for us um even outside of just the the content marketing front i can't tell you how many times i've shuddered at the idea of starting a facebook group just to start a facebook group right or a linkedin group to start a linkedin group so i think that's where it starts to come back to those two questions we talked about before right that audience that we were talking about here what do they want and then two what do you have the capacity to do, right? And what are the other things that we're already kind of putting our eggs in this basket that perhaps if we take some of our eggs out, they're not going to get the love that they deserve. So I think even if it's, you know, finding the kind of core reasons that maybe it doesn't fit with your particular strategy, whether that's capacity, content, audience, whatever it might be, and finding some sort of way to figure out what is it that they really want. Do they want, you know, to reach their audience on a new platform? Do they really just want to do something visual? find kind of an alternative option for them to be able to kind of pitch back and maybe workshop a little bit so you can come to some sort of, you know, happy medium. The art of negotiation, right, Lexi? <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, we've got another question here, and I think this leads into, Courtney, what, what we were talking about, you know, in prep for this panel too. When's the best time to develop a new content strategy? Annually, upon the launch of a new product, all of the above. Um, like typically I would always say maybe about two weeks prior to like starting a new quarter, you know, March is coming. So we're almost at the end of the first quarter already. Um, I, I think that would be a good time to kind of go over, you know, what worked for quarter one, what in, like our analytics and the insights showing like what posts did better and what areas versus others. And I really like, as far as social media management, like I really prefer to focus more on, of course, PR versus I, oh, sometimes you might need to hire a social media manager. And I just always provide like that content calendar and that strategy because depending on what day, I know social media has been kind of sensitive. Like some days, like posting something funny may not be appropriate you know, for the calendar or that day for that trend. So leaving like that wiggle room where I will always like, okay, let's post this twice or three times a week. And I always try to not overdo it. Um, but that could turn off a consumer as well. But, you know, then you do have those clients where you might need to kind of post three times a day and like stories because in the target audience, you could kind of forget, you know, those certain clients where it's like, hey, I need to, stay in your face with the product every day because it's always something new or it's always a new it girl, you know, new this, new that. So it's kind of just 
staying on your toes. I don't I don't really like to say it's always like a set in stone time frame. Maybe bi weekly, that may be too much. But as far as a quarter, I like to say at least like a week or two prior of starting a new quarter. And Lexi, did you have any further thoughts on that when when you reevaluate kind of your content approach? Yeah, I, I typically like looking for a lot of our clients, obviously, on a quarterly basis. Um, I feel like annual is just way too much changes in a year, especially now. And I think we've all learned that um, at the launch of a new product, new initiative or anything, that was always a good time to kind of have that sort of pulse check too, just to make sure everything we're doing is still aligning. So I think just putting those intentional touch points in place is just more important than anything. Yeah, that's a great point. Content calendars are never final. There's something that's always revolving, something that's always changing. So that that's a pretty, as far as starting it, I'm not too specific on when we should start. I like to give myself at least a month in advance before launching a new product, just because I need to make sure, I, I need to do my research, right? And I need to make sure that all of this is gonna make sense. But also understanding that just because we planned something a month ago does not mean that this week is going to work or next week is going to work or next month it's going to work. I would like to say it's kind of no right or wrong answer. I really like to use the content calendar more as like a template. You know, of course, it's there, it's there for our structure and strategy. But, you know, sometimes we just have to like go with the flow. Great. Okay, we still have a lot of questions here. Wow. So Steve had another question here. What are your thoughts on content regarding video content specifically? Facebook used to push live videos a lot. Now they're trying to keep it short with Reels and compete with TikTok. Do you think short videos like TikTok and Reels will continue to gain momentum? We got some love for that right now. I would <laughs> um, say, so. you know, content is key. And a lot of times now, videos are getting more engagement than um, just regular photos. And with like the different algorithms going on, videos make your stuff more visible faster than photos these days. So keep going with the videos. And I would say, so A, I, I think I'm gonna show my age here, but I'm finally just now starting to come around to vertical first video, which took a very, very long time to do. Um, but with that, I think just embracing the current content standards for video can take a lot of pressure off content creators, especially you know brands that maybe haven't done a lot of video content. They're only used to very, very produced, well done, horizontal 1080p video, um, or even you know necessarily really, really done live feeds. Embracing some more of kind of that piecemeal impromptu, you know, cell phone quality video. Um, I'm constantly blown away by how nice the new iPhone video quality is. So I think there's a good way of even being able to combine some of those elements. Um, doing lives from Instagram um, and things along those lines are a great way of kind of being able to combine some of those elements and still using that live element that does get pushed to people. So you're still getting that benefit of that notification on their timeline. Um, while again, still keeping it a little bit low quality and a little bit more fun um, in that, you know, disappearing element. So just combine your efforts, use them across the board. And it also, let's think about how much time people are spending on mobile. Let's think about what's digestible for people. I'm not trying to watch a five minute or necessarily a two minute video. I think that's because I'm using my phone in between me working and me being on location for things. I need to get the information quick. Um, you might have to give it to me in multiple videos, but at least I can take the chunks and process it and memorize, you know, something that's, that I'm going to attach to your brand because something longer is going to get lost. Yeah, bite-sizing it. You see a lot of that, definitely. So, so it's taking that video um, idea too, we had another question about how do you prepare an integrated approach? Let's see, you know, if you're using video content too, across traditional, digital, et cetera, when developing content, how do you kind of integrate it across? Go ahead, Olivia. When I'm pitching, I like to use the same videos or I like to hyperlink things in my uh, press release to social. 
I'm making sure that I'm maxing out that content. If you took the time to produce it, sometimes it, it's a bit more costly than others. We're going to use it until there's no drops left. Um, <laughs> thank you, Lexi. I needed it. <laughs> um, just making, and, and when you're pitching, giving stations, giving journalists, whether it's going to be print or web, the opportunity to spread it across their platforms. I mean, what more do I need to say? Giving them all the pieces, I think is so key, especially now when pitching. Um, again, just like all of us, journalists are very busy. So giving them everything they need from, you know, quick little tidbits and uh quotes to actual video YouTube links and things, they're all critical. Um, and I think when plotting this, that's where that calendar comes back into play that we keep talking about right from the beginning, taking a step back and going, okay, we're producing this blog or we're producing X, Y, and Z, where else are we supporting that? How many times is that going out on social? Could we backlink to that in one of our press releases? What could we be doing to further integrate those efforts? That planning, I think, starting right from the beginning makes it so much easier than having a piece and then going, okay, now what do we do with it? And furthermore, seeing if, if you have a broadcast piece, seeing something flash across your screen that you see across your phone is going to heighten your attention to detail or just awareness of that brand in general. Brand recognition all day, creating that sort of consistency in your messaging and your visuals. It's so, so important. Such good advice and things to think about, guys. Uh, lots of questions still. Um, when a client requests a quarterly content calendar, and we talked about this a little bit, what's your typical timeline for how quickly you need to turn around the finalized calendar for them if they're looking at and approving all these? What's kind of the rule of thumb you go by? This is a fun one. I get this one a lot. So determining first, so obviously if we've been talking about, you know, whether that's, you know, annual or quarterly, whatever it might be, we know things are going to shift, right? So we always say that that content calendar is definitely a living doc, but determine what are the elements that need to go to approval and by when. Um, for some of our clients, we can realistically look ahead and say, okay, quarter by quarter, we know that this is going to be our really broad campaign that we're putting over it, but then we can kind of find these smaller campaigns and content buckets to feed into to make them a bit more timely. But with all things, I think it's always important to be realistic that, especially now, something crazy could happen. So giving that with a little bit of a grain of salt of, you know, here are some of the contingency plans or we should be, you know, prepared or we can easily shift here um, is I think also important in just establishing some of that flexibility right off the front. Great. So we've got a question here from Matthew. What advice do you have for integrated marketing agencies looking to market their often hard to understand and intangible services online? <laughs> Olivia. Focus on the value. Don't tell me it is what you're doing. Focus on the value. What am I gaining from this? And I mean, from all sides. What am I learning mentally? How are you changing my mindset? What am I getting tangibly? How am I feeling after I'm working with you? If you have something that is hard to understand, you gotta strike that emotional appeal. Strike how, tell me about the transformation. I think that's how you, you win that one over. Yeah, starting with those benefits, right? That why should they care? They don't have to care about your brand or even the things that you know your brand or your product is doing. Starting first with the okay, what are you looking for? What's your need? What's the you know challenge at hand? And then starting with the addressing um, how your product, brand, or whatever you know enhances that is critical. That's that you know customer first marketing that we were talking about before. I would kind of also say always ask yourself, would I buy this? Like that's kind of what it comes down to. As a consumer, would I want to purchase this? Why do I need it? And why do everyone else want it? Because everyone wants something, you know, they don't have. So it's like that demand is crucial. 
And leverage visuals too for really hard to understand concepts and things for your audience. I think, again, similar to what we were talking about earlier, if it's really hard to explain something in a super concise way, using things like videos, infographics, um, things along those lines to really just make it easier for them to see it. Um, and thinking of all those different types of learning styles, I think is really critical, especially with any complex or B2B type client. And also help me to understand if sometimes clients think that they have one problem that needs one solution. When your hard to explain solution may actually be what it is that they need. So take your time to educate people on, you know, where you fit into their business needs. Very cool, guys. Thank you. Um, there, there's still a, quite a few questions, but this one kind of struck me because I really want to hear it myself too. What's your favorite memory or experience when it comes to content creation? Do any of your previous projects stick out in your mind as exceptionally successful, maybe even more than expected? What led to that level of success? I think I, I might have a couple here. Um, one was, I can say, pre-pandemic. Um, for NIAS, obviously, here in Detroit, um, that's an auto show. It's like bread and butter for B2B and automotive, especially, you know, tier one and tier two suppliers. So we worked with one of our clients to really understand um, how steel, you know, was part of, at that point, autonomous vehicles were really where we were kind of turning um, our industry focus. So working with them, we created blog content. We had influencers on site helping us to do some social content with the media. Um, and then we also assist them in creating a VR experience with the Oculus. So we had media um, and industry folk come in and sit in an autonomous vehicle with their VR headset and see how steel was actually impacting autonomous vehicles of the future and being applied. So that was, again, trying to understand first, what is our audience? What do they care about? How can we connect it? to what they care about, and then how can we then have them experience it? Um, and I think we did that in a really effective way across social, in person, in the media, on the website. Um, we were really strategic about using that messaging across places. That sounds fun. Where do I sign up? <laughs> right? I don't, I think Oculus, are Oculus still big now? That's the other thing that I will say right. um, whenever you're investing in anything quite a bit, understanding how quickly technology moves now right. um, is aggressive. I haven't worked on anything as cool as that because that's up my alley. That by, again, that was by far the coolest one. So yeah. <laughs> my head would have exploded, but I did get the opportunity to work on the tomorrow campaign with Nike for one of my clients. And it really, it was leading up to the Tokyo games. And it really, when you think about like, what's your favorite sports moment ever, you always think of the past, but they positioned it in a way where we're thinking about the future. So I think that that was like one of my favorites because we're changing we're, we're, we're helping you build anticipation for expectations, but we're even changing the way that you think about like sports and the conversations that you're having about it. Look, your stuff, your stuff sound really cool. <laughs> I probably will, only, I would say, um, this is during COVID uh, with NAACP Detroit chapter. We did a huge campaign for Take Your Souls to the Polls. And that campaign really did well. It went viral in the aspect to where, okay, of course, with all the controversy with the votes, Detroit had to do a whole recount of the vote. And it involved a lot of first time voters. So I would say like having those like fundraisers and campaigns with, you know, millennials and like Gen X generation kind of brought a new fresh take, you know, on the whole voting process. Like, our what the people felt like their voice really copped in that um, election. So definitely virtual aspects with like the ideas of these hybrid events have definitely helped kind of, you know, pivot and 
the whole way you do PR and marketing these days. Such good examples and experiences you all have had. This is incredible. Um, we only have about five minutes left and there are still a number of questions in the chat here. So um, I'm just looking across here and, and I'm interested in this one too. Newsletters or resources that you all subscribe to that keep you up to date on best practices in, in this capacity. Any that come top of mind that we can share? Adweek's daily um, newsletter that comes out. Um, it's collective and then the PR daily. Both of those are really phenomenal. Um, also getting back on Medium and paying for a Medium subscription. Um, my Medium uh, selections have just been phenomenal. So I think kind of those are my big three on a daily basis that I'm constantly looking for for articles. Honestly, crucify me for it. I've unsubscribed from all my email newsletters and I've decided to follow everybody on social. Yeah. Um, that's the quickest first way. Hand. Or, mm -hmm. Yes, it's the quickest way for me to figure out what it, what's even going to be in the newsletter. By the time I get it, I'm pretty sure it's a little dated and I, I need it fresh. So I honestly just follow all of those that Lexi just mentioned. And I follow Social Media Week um, on Instagram um, and Twitter. And everything else, I think, is pretty industry specific, but just as like as far as the industries that I serve, but as far as comms, I think those are great rules of thumb. Oh, and I also follow Coverage Press, but that that's more of a ROI platform, but still. I like to kind of subscribe to other to other publicists, um, their platforms. Um, sometimes there's a lot of informative, like very informative on like, hey, on you know, different trends in our, within our industry and podcasts have been kind of cool and like a faster way to kind of get those, like what's happening in the news and definitely social media is always like hand on first and look, don't sleep on Google alerts. I mean, can never go wrong with Google alerts. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we've got three minutes that I want to ask this question, this le one last question. And for those that I we didn't get a chance to answer, hang out with us a little bit afterwards, and then you can you can ask it yourself directly. Uh, what's your advice on starting a social media platform for a new business who isn't there already? Um, how do you uh, find the target audience? I don't, who, I'm just going to say two things, and then you guys can take it away. We're not necessarily finding those people. These people should just be migrating from everywhere else. But mm -hmm. continue, panel. As I was going to say, so before you, you find them, you should make sure that you're, they're there before right? you even get on that platform. Uh, once you decide, let's say you already know that they're there. They're just not following you yet. That's where I think it's going to really, you're going to have to leverage A, your you know employee advocacy whatever it might be use your internal resources to get to their you know uh their connections start to follow and build that up right but outside of that start to look for your influencer marketing um, make sure that those channels are connected everywhere are they on all of your content marketing assets with the little icon are they on the bottom of your newsletter have you promoted them on your other channels um, but before, again, you even launch that channel, doing that sort of research, the social listening, the competitive monitoring to make sure that that audience is already there before you start it is really key. I agree. It's kind of like that internal evaluation. Hey, let's kind of pull back the layers and go back to the basics on our, like our website, you know, is the content there. And before we just run a social media, do we have the quality content? to kind of produce, you know, the traffic we want because first impression is key, especially for like a new brand on social media. Yes. For Absolutely. Instagram alone, you have those nine squares before they decide to follow or keep it pushing. So capacity all day, quality and capacity. I think we're gonna end there. <laughs> I think we've said it all. Lexi, Courtney, and Olivia, thank you so much for your insights and joining the panel today. And thanks for all the questions to, to those who joined. Stick around if you um, have more questions or just want to meet with, with the panelists. Thank you all.